Tonight's Nationwide is devoted to the story of the Titanic. We remember shipbuilding in Belfast, where the Titanic was constructed. An exhibition remembering some of the Irish passengers who were on board the vessel when it sank in 1912. We view the magnificent new Titanic Centre, and we meet the husband and wife who stayed faithful to Belfast during tough times and are now looking forward to better days. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Nationwide coming from Belfast. Across the water, the Titanic Signature Building. It's the most ambitious tourism initiative in the history of Northern Ireland and it opens officially for business tomorrow and it promises to be one of the most exciting visitor centres on the island. The construction of the building was completed in time for the anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic 100 years ago next month. This evening's programme, prepared by our Northern Editor Tommy Gorman, is dedicated to the story of the Titanic. The views from Cave Hill give a sense of why location has been such an influential factor in the modern history of Belfast. At the mouth of the River Lagan, with instant access to the sea, the city was the perfect location for a shipbuilding industry. The iron and steel had to be imported, but the workforce developed a reputation for quality. For a time, the exploits of the Harland and Wolf Company made Belfast the most important shipbuilding centre in the world. On these very days, 100 years ago, a vessel that had been built and launched in Belfast was preparing to make its first transatlantic journey. As the world knows, the Titanic never made it to New York. After colliding with an iceberg, what was then the world's largest liner sank on April the 15th, 1912, with the loss of 1,517 lives. A century later, Belfast is preparing to revisit the Titanic story. Belfast's shipbuilding tradition is charted in an exhibition running at the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, five miles from the city. Harland Wolf had been building ships for the White Star Line for uh, sort of over 40 years prior to constructing Titanic. We have photographs in our collection which show the workforce uh, leaving the shipyard. There were uh, upwards of nearly 15,000 employees at the yard when, uh, in 1912. Um, by the early 1900s, you know, it was the largest shipyard in the world. In many respects, it was almost the Cape Canaveral of its day. Um, all of the different skills that were, uh, that were required to build a ship were concentrated on Qu uh, Queen's Island. The majority of the worker bees in the industry, the skilled craft workers, came from the streets of terraced houses in East Belfast. Generation followed generation into a job at the yards. When that cycle of guaranteed employment ended, it had profound consequences. Well, this is very much a working class area. and There would have been a tradition in this area of people who would have lived here, they would have worked in the shipyards, the women worked in the mills, some of the men would have worked in Sirocco works. But predominantly the people here would have been hard working um, sh shipyard workers. And their sons would have also been in the yard as apprenticeships. So education, as an example, wasn't highly esteemed in this area because, as my father said to me, don't worry about further education. Go out and earn a few bob and get the money in for your mother or, or whatever. And that would have been the, very much the tradition. In 1912, there were 15,000 people that actually worked in, in Hardwoof on, on, on the Titanic. And something like over 3,000 of those people would have been Catholics. So the, right throughout the, the, the history here, even right throughout the Troubles, you would still have um, people from the Catholic community working here. Having said that, at times of political tension, the shipyard and East Belfast and in fact Belfast Northern Ireland there were difficulties and we, we would be the first to recognize that. The phrase like shifting the deck chairs on the Titanic 
is part of our vernacular. James Cameron's 1997 film, The Titanic, grossed $1.8 billion. It was in fact the first film to reach the $1 billion mark, and its success was a reminder of the worldwide interest in the Titanic story. In the County Tyrone countryside, 70 miles from Belfast, the Ulster American Folk Park is making its contribution to the programme of Titanic centenary events. The Folk Park is staging an exhibition to tell the human stories of the 113 passengers from what was then a 32-county Ireland who boarded the Titanic in Cove, or Queenstown, as it was known 100 years ago. This is um, a remarkable image. Um, it's the final moments of our Titanic, our third-class Titanic passengers as they leave Ireland to board Titanic. They're on the tender America, they're bringing them out. As well as bringing passengers out to Titanic, these tenders brought out the mail. There's over 1,300 mail bags here, letters all going to America, letters from Ireland to America. And when the ships would come back in, of course, it would, there would be the same, same amount of letters coming back from family, friends, um, you know, explaining what conditions were like, possibly sending money. Now, this is 1912, and 30,000 people are actually leaving Ireland that year. But on the 11th of April, uh, 113 of them would leave from Queenstown. The first thing that you see from the map is that most of the Titanic passengers came from a line below here. Uh, the reason for this is because we had a port in Moville and we had a port in Belfast and there was a number of sailings from both those ports. So in general, people in the northern third of Ireland were drawn towards those two ports, whereas people uh, in the lower half of Ireland were drawn towards Queenstown. In 1912, the standard of uh, uh, travel had improved because uh, the White Star Line were very conscious that uh, emigrants were their bread and butter. So they went out of their way to make sure that passengers had a comfortable voyage. This is a recreation of a third class cabin done to scale, so it gives you a sense of the size and really how comfortable things were. We know that uh, Mary McGovern from County Cavan Shared, shared with uh, two other cabin girls. They may not have known each other, but uh, counties were inclined to stick together, as we still do even today. The girls, uh, when they'd made themselves comfortable in the cabin, they would have been delighted that they'd run on water, and that uh, if they didn't feel well, as another lady did, she, some of the friends would bring them down the fruit from the table, and they could eat that in their cabin. They would um, or even get a little bit of beef tea, which was brought to them by a steward. This is a very interesting photograph uh, of the time. This ship here, as we see, with the big hatch doors open, this ship here is the Carpathia, which was the closest ship to respond to the Titanic. And it was Carpathia that lifted all the survivors. And what we actually see here in the photograph is a Titanic lifeboat alongside the Carpathia. One of the Irish survivors in particular, and Margaret uh, Devaney from County Sligo, was very lucky. She, was, she had been given a small pocket knife uh, by her brother and when she was on the lifeboat, uh, the lifeboat got snagged up and she, she was able to give the little pocket knife to a steward who was then able to cut, cut the ropes free and allow the lifeboat to get down into the water. There's photographs of her in her later life still with the pen knife and also with a wee souvenir of the lifeboat as well. This group of costume from our, our collections here in the museum uh, is telling the story of Margaret Rice and her five children. Uh, Margaret was uh, returning to her home in Montana. Um, she was a widow woman and she had come back to Athlone to settle for a while, but um, decided that it was better to go back to America and, and, and raise her children there. Uh, and unfortunately, they didn't survive. They, Third-class Irish passengers were some of the last to get on board the lifeboats, and uh, I'm sure things were just chaotic. And uh, she couldn't maybe make a decision to either try and get some of them saved. But uh, it is it is a story that pulls at the heartstrings. Among those last were a County Donegal couple. He was travelling on promotion to a new job to work with Lipton's Tea in New York. His young wife was with him. 
his niece is still alive. Well, I'm the second youngest of nine of us, whom there's only two of us left. And of course, there was none of us on this earth when Uncle Neil was lost. But every time I look at his picture, which is every day of the week, most times I get very, very sentimental. I yearn for an uncle, always something I never had. And I, I suppose it's beyond thinking about it now, but you still do think about it, you know. He was such a wonderful man to look at his picture. The Titanic's tragic end didn't undermine Belfast's shipbuilding industry. In fact, the needs for vessels during the First World War meant the yards worked flat out in the years immediately after the disaster. Three factors eventually brought about decline. A change in US immigration policy halted the huge volumes of Europeans crossing the Atlantic. Planes rather than ships would soon become the transport of choice. And European cities like Belfast lost their prominence as centres of shipbuilding. The numbers employed here declined dramatically. Many of the sites in the area of the city known as Queen's Island fell silent. During the decades of the Troubles, attracting replacement industries was almost impossible. But in the 14 years since the Good Friday Agreement, Belfast has got back some of its confidence. The area where the Titanic was originally built and launched is part of the fight back. Beside the pump house at the old dry dock, there's a new coffee shop. New industries and administrative centres have put roots down in what's now known as Belfast Titanic Quarter. Harland and Wolf's Yards are doing some ship repair works, but they're also branching out into new age engineering ventures, like the manufacture of wind turbines. The district has also become the new home for Belfast's Metropolitan Art College. Opened in 2007 and set on an eight-acre site, the Paint Hall Studio has become the chosen location for several international filmmakers. As happened in places like Dublin's Docklands and Temple Bar, and in London's Docklands, this part of Belfast is changing. The Titanic Signature Project, the most expensive single tourism investment in Northern Ireland's history, is the most dramatic gamble to date. It's the biggest single tourism project investment in Northern Ireland's history. Costing £100 million, it set all sorts of construction records. It took 700 concrete lorry deliveries over a 24-hour period to complete Ireland's largest concrete pour. It houses Ireland's largest escalator. Six storeys high, with nine galleries and three floors of underground car parks. Funding for the building came from four sources. Northern Ireland's government, Belfast Harbour, Belfast City Council, and two businessmen, Dubliner Dermot Desmond and Donegal man Pat Doherty. They already own 200 acres in the former shipyards area. Companies linked to them won the right to build the centre and to run it. When we took over the uh, Titanic Quarter, that's Dermot Desmond and myself, um, we knew there was a certain amount of risk um, because it was within 56 million to start here uh, and we haven't had any return and may not have for another few years so it's like 10 years of no return very few people would take that long term risk uh, but this is the development of this whole Queen's Island will take could be 70, 80 years yet but it's as a site for developing, it's second in on in Europe. Where else can you get in excess of 200 acres 
waterfront in the centre of a city. Um, to me, that says it all. Yeah, uh, it's long term, but I think it's um, it'll work in the end, and it'll be f fantastic for everyone. There's nothing like this project on the island of Ireland. In one place, a visitor feels on board a lift moving through the different floors of the Titanic. Another feature is the six-seater car ride, giving a sense of the sights, sounds, and even the smells of where the Titanic was built. All the galleries are lined with interactive screens where the visitor can check details, like the names and nationalities of the passengers on board the vessel. Another feature is the section showing the range of accommodation for the first, second and third class passengers. The US oceanographer Robert Ballard was a key figure in the discovery of the Titanic wreck in 1985. The visitor centre has remarkable video footage provided by him. If you do things and you do them right and do them well, I think they work. What most happens is people don't finish a lot of stuff to the full extent to make it attractive. Um, and I think that's what we've done here we've, with the help of everybody from the government, the council, the harbour, all contributed to this. And I think in time to come this will speak for itself. This will be um, a draw of tourists, I hope, for the next hundred years. And about that moment of time, the ship took her last plunge. Yes. In another area, video screens and audio recordings are used to restage the two inquiries that were carried out into the disaster. Had I been asleep, I do not think it would have wakened me. An engineer from County Offaly had the role of project manager. People ask me, what did I know about the Titanic? I knew it was made here in Belfast or built here in Belfast down through the years. but. Um, Seeing all the international companies coming here and, and realizing the, the extent and the reach that the Titanic story has around the world in Abu Dhabi, in China, in Argentina, all those people were here to talk about the Titanic story. More, more people know about the Titanic than know that it was built in Ireland. You know, and that's, that's they, they became a focus for us to try and tell that story. You know, and that's, yes, the Titanic is a huge disaster, but it was a fantastic feat of endeavor by so many workers here 100 years ago. But it was also by a feat of endeavor by Irishmen, built, built by Irishmen. And that's, that's a story that we want to get across I think, and start telling people. It became a, a project that we wanted to deliver. Everybody fell in love with it, and it just became a huge objective for everybody over the four years. A painter didn't just come in here to paint a wall. Normally on a project, he would paint a wall, but here he